play. And another, another foul on Ward. His third for setting a screen. He's such a physical play, although George Taylor just got caught with a moving screen. Kick and roll. And a foul. Offensive foul coming up to that foul. Get it right there. So Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Moving Screen Podcast. I'm Brendan Quinn from The Athletic. I'm here with the great Dylan Burkhart of UM Hoops. Dylan, what's up, man? What's going on? Uh, not too much. How's Las Vegas treating you? Vegas is good. Vegas is good. I came out, and uh, it's 113 degrees today, for one. So uh, it's a dry heat, though. You know? <laughs> 113 <laughs> degrees is still hot. <laughs> um, I actually came out for work meetings, but was able to pop over to uh, Summer League for a day or two. I haven't seen too many of the Michigan guys or Michigan State guys. Uh, talked to Beeline for a minute. Wasn't able to get any uh, exclusive sit-down to get him you know, to tear apart college basketball and say why he left Michigan and all that part, but maybe someday, guys. Um, <laughs> so, uh, no, good week. And then uh, get a little vacation next week. All right. Summer's treating you well. Um, More importantly, how was your first trip to Moneyball? My first trip to Moneyball was completely <laughs> a nothing. <laughs> Drove all the way there just to see everyone no-show, which was lovely to see them all show up the next Moneyball. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you going to do? I love it. Might be my last Moneyball. <laughs> First and last. For those who don't know, like it's 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 a very interesting scene um, where you know there's no obligation for anyone to do anything. The funny part is the only dude that I know that like showed up for every one of his Moneyball games is freaking Miles Bridges, because uh, I guess that's just the way he rolls. But um, I feel I feel bad for you. That's a long drive from Cleveland to the Aim High Gym, my man. Also at Moneyball. That night, Miles Bridges, and it was not even his game. So sometimes you just got to make an appearance. Uh, so today's episode, we are thinking uh, of talking about new additions. Um, obviously, Joey Hauser is headed to Michigan State. That's been known for a little bit, but I was able to spend some time with Joey um, in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, and uh, and also a new addition to Michigan. Franz Wagner, so <laughs> at least we had the pronunciation down after three years of Mo. Um, and practice. Yeah, so we're just going to talk about I think the the big two biggest new pieces um, for each program, and um, let's I mean we'll start with what's shiny and new, right? Um, you know, Franz Wagner coming aboard at Michigan, I think. I think he's going to be a really key piece. He's going to play a major role in next year's team. Um, but I'm also thinking that right now, in terms of it being July 11th, the biggest part of the Franz Wagner edition is the optics, that they were able to, to land this kid considering everything that went down in the program. Do you agree or disagree? I think the optics are certainly a good story. Mm-hmm. I th- I personally think his impact on what next year's roster actually looks like is more significant than what the sure. story looks like this summer. I mean, I think he do you, like I guess that's I, where like, I yeah, would I'm start. saying like that's like that I didn't mean it that I meant it more like it's July basketball is still so freaking far away, you know what I mean? Like it is it is positive energy for a new regime. It is um it, sh- it does actually kind of show some kind of branch from the Beeline era to the new era, the fact that they were able to get Moe's brother. You know what I mean? Like, just in terms of that stuff, obviously, I mean, of course, the most important thing is what he does for the, the program next year and what this means to his personal, professional aspirations. Like, those are the two most important things, of course. But, like, sitting here in July, you're in Cleveland, I'm in Vegas, like, it's kind of a big. It's kind of a big deal us, what it means. Yeah, it gives us something, gives to, talk us something to talk about. Boom! Moving screen, new fresh content. So <laughs> I guess there's two sides to it that we should probably talk mm-hmm. about. One is how it all kind of came together, yeah. and you wrote a story about that. And then two is 
what is the realistic kind of expectation for the impact that he can have on Michigan season coming up and I guess yeah. in the future. Yeah. Um, so you want to, we'll start with the backstory. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I wrote about it here. I know, um, uh, other places have had similar versions of, of the story. I, I focused as much as I could. I thought the two biggest components in this thing were one Mo and two, um, how his official visit actually, uh, transpired. And I mean, this is one of the crazier things that I've ever heard or encountered or whatever in, in, you know, over whatever, 10, 12, 14, I don't know how many years of covering college basketball, like for someone to go on an official visit the day that the coach leaves and still have an official visit does not, that, that, that doesn't happen. It, it, it's totally bizarre. And also, I didn't really work this into the story, but like, there's a really good chance, and I don't actually have this confirmed. I think Beeline might be the only one that could actually confirm it. But like, outside of the Cleveland front office, probably a handful of individuals in the Cleveland front office, and John and his wife, like Franz Wagner was basically the first person to know that John was leaving Michigan. Um, for those who don't, haven't read the story, Beeline called Franz basically while he was at the airport in Berlin about to board a flight with his parents to come on an official visit and meet Mo in Ann Arbor. And Beeline told him, you know, before you get on that plane, you need to know that I'm taking the head coaching job with, with the Cavaliers. This was before his own staff knew. This was before his own players knew. Uh, they would all find out the next morning via Twitter. Um, and they all decided to get on the plane. And part of it was like, it was an official visit, so it was a free trip. Um, you know, Michigan was flipping the bill for the whole thing. So, and Mo was already there. Right, so it was kind of a, all right, we'll get a family trip, see, still see the school, whatever, you know. But, I mean, I had someone on the staff tell me that they basically thought there was absolutely zero chance once he got there, and they just kind of turned it into more of like a reunion thing, but still showed him the campus and went on the tour and did the thing, and kind of like as the day went on, it ended up kind of getting more of a feel of an official visit, even though it was under the strangest circumstances. All these guys, their first concern needs to be, do I still have a job? The f- players on the roster, their first concern is, do I still have a space here? Do I want to be here? Should I be looking at other options, right? Everyone, you got to look mm-hmm. out for number one when kind of the wheels go off the rail. And, and then here comes Franz Wagner landing at Detroit airport and I, <laughs> I'm here. it's kind of one of those stories that I feel like it'll just kind of grow and how ridiculous it is as time yeah, passes. Definitely. Right. Like, especially if Wagner does have a big impact mm-hmm. at Michigan, it's sort of that like mythical story of that unofficial visit without any coach and just yeah. how it all came to be. And also it being Juwan Howard's first commitment, mm-hmm. like, it's only going to, you're going to tell the story in 10 years and it's going to sound even more ridiculous. Like he biked himself around Ann Arbor for a week, like on his official <laughs> right. visit. I mean, it's just pretty crazy how it all came together. And it was a kind of a fortuitous string of events that kind of turned it all around, right? Yeah. I mean, it couldn't get much more ridiculous than Beeline slipping off to Germany in season to go visit with Mo. In, in his recruitment and kind of how that story went um, went on to become like mythological type stuff, right? As Mo mm-hmm. becomes the guy in the NCAA tournament and stuff like that. Um, yeah, no, I think you're spot on there. Um, but to, to all their credit, you know, those guys did keep it together and, and did have a visit and, um, someone currently still at the program, one of the things that he said to me that really just stuck out was like, we had to have a conversation of like, what's the point of even doing any of this? You know? And because when you're so blindsided, like, it does get easy to be like, whatever, man. Like, this is a bunch of bullshit anyway. I can't believe this is happening, right? Like, yeah, um, it's easy to just punt on things. And, uh, and they didn't, you know, to their, to... 
um, Saudi Washington, Luke Yaklich, uh DeAndre Haynes, uh, the whole support staff, you know, from Sanderson to Chris Hunter all the way down, you know, Jay Schooner's out there. He basically on the agenda list for the official visit, right? There are times slotted where individuals are doing certain things. Well, now all the spots that said John Beeline are now empty boxes, right? So Jay, the grad, the grad assistant, he filled all those spots basically is what I was told at least. And, um, and the day kind of took on a life of its own. But the biggest thing that everyone said is that if it weren't for Mo being there, the whole, the, the, it would have, there's no way, there's no way it would have worked. Well, he wouldn't have gotten on the plane if Mo Probably wasn't not. there. Right. Probably I mean, that, that kind of comes down to how the, why the whole thing was a thing to begin with mm-hmm. and how it kind of turned around. So that, I mean, makes a lot of natural sense, right? right. I mean, there, you, there would be no real reason for him to be there if Mo wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And that, but even the dynamics of the visit itself, too. For sure. You know, there was only like one stabilizer there and it was Mo. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's quite something and kind of a, I mean, give Juwan Howard a lot of credit also, but kind of a nice break to walk into a situation like that didn't have to go that way. And if everyone right. doesn't chip in in that situation, that's a dead possibility probably, right? And totally. it's just over. Um, not a bad way to kind of stroll into a new situation when you could use a little help yeah and then on the, on the Juwan thing too like it was kind of coincidental circumstances I think a little bit and I you know I haven't asked Ward about this but you know I Ward couldn't have possibly really known at the time when he hires Juwan that outside of the internal candidates Saudi and Luke like Juwan was indirectly like the best outside hire you could have made to act to end up landing Franz. Mm-hmm. Um, his NBA contacts, right? LeBron is on a team with Mo at the time, and LeBron's telling Mo that Juwan's the best guy. He can develop him. He's you know Derek he's a stand up dude. Blah blah blah. Derek Walton is on his is a teammate of his in Alba, and not only played with Mo but played for the Heat. When Juwan Howard was there, um, Duncan Robinson, teammate of Mo, and played under Juwan. Like, there was just a lot of weird boxes able to be checked. Um, because, like, you know, if they hired Joe Schmo, whatever, head coach, right? Um, there wouldn't be any there, sort of there, reason there, for right. buy-in, right? Right. Other than it just being Michigan and, like, Mo being able to tell Franz, like, how much he enjoyed the college experience, which is a huge thing in this, is how much Mo enjoyed going to college. And it happened to be at Michigan, and everything well, everything went well there, so that's the natural fit. Um, you know, other than that, if, it's, if it was some rando coach, you know, there's no reason. Would have there's no reason to, to do it. Any random other coach would have had to recreate those kind of alumni relationships to kind of bring yeah. Mo, Duncan, Derek into the fold. Like that would be on the job it's, description. Instead, those exist. Those existed already, mm-hmm. which you wouldn't have in really any other circumstance. Totally. Um, okay, so you've watched lots of film, right? I have. Um, let's get into uh, the good stuff here. The, his fit, his talent level, his ceiling, all that. Um, where do you want to start? So I guess we should probably start high level. Mm-hmm. Um, he is a six eight ish, supposedly almost six nine, guard slash wing prospect. Mm-hmm. Um, he is not. He's much more of a. He plays those mostly the two for Alba Berlin is what I understand and what I saw in film, and he projects to, as a guard going forward, no, no matter how much he grows, more than Mo ever did. Um, his He's at his best playing off the catch, catch and shoot, or catch and drive attacking closeouts. Mm-hmm. And that's basically the bulk of his game right now. What's tricky is a lot of his minutes this last year were with Elba Berlin, where he was playing, again, with a senior professional team. So he was very much pigeonholed into that role. 
basically all the points he scored were either catch and shoot in transition or kind of Duckins post up a smaller guard with like a little cut. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of his role on that team. When he played at a younger level, or I guess a lower level, not younger, it was still a professional team, but it was like the third division in Germany. He did a lot more with the ball in his hands. He could do a little bit of off the dribble shooting, and he kind of played a more complete game. I think that is where you look for him to grow into a role at the college level eventually but his immediate impact at Michigan is that they desperately need someone who can catch and shoot off the wing and play off of Xavier Simpson's ball screens and he's really as close to a perfect fit as you can get for what Michigan needs on its roster right now so the upside on him um and when, when I think people have been a little bit quick to just say you know oh man big possibility of a one and done for for this year um, how much of that is based on potential upside? How much of that is based on evidence? So I know most NBA draft type people kind of see him as like a top 100 prospect, you'd probably say, mm-hmm. for like this draft class coming up, um, which really could go. That's really generic outside of the top 20 or 30 prospects that are kind of like locked in draft picks. So you, that's kind of gives you a lot of coverage. But I think that. It's obviously still a lot of potential. He's only 17. I think he turns 18 in April. That's young even for a freshman in college. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's still kind of developing into his body. He's very skinny. Um, so there's certainly a level that he still has to get to. But I think you look at a guy who's six nine with some guard skills and can shoot 40% from three, and there's a lot to like at the NBA level. I don't know if that's one, two, three years, right? Like, it's hard to tell in that mm-hmm. regard. Um, but the potential's there. Right. Like, I, I, in in trying to project what he is next year, you know, I wonder how much of it is going to be, pretty, like, standstill shooting, just three-point shots, and how much of the other stuff we're actually going to see right off the bat. Um, first of all, like, on his shooting, I, I love his stroke. Um, he doesn't bring, if, if you, first of all, you have great video on UM Hoops right now of, of various things that he does. And, but if anyone watching it, if you look at his, his shooting, um, he has a very tight, clean shot. Doesn't bring the ball down at all. Everything is right in front of him. Um, really gets the ball up. Like, I think it is a, his form is just, is very true, um, not fluky at all so um he's going to be a really reliable shooter just walking in the door like I don't know how everything else is going to project if he can actually you know beat guys off the bounce stuff like that right away just don't know but like the guys walking in the door is the best shooter on the team I would say 100 percent. and if you look at I wrote about this a little bit when I, I wrote a story about kind of the impact he could make and Michigan loses over half of its spot-up production from last year, which mm-hmm. is basically anything off the catch, right? So catch and shoot, catch and drive. Basically what Iggy Brasdakis, Jordan Poole, Charles Matthews did a lot of, right? Um, they need guys who can just do – Xavier Sims is going to get you the ball in the right spots out of ball screens. Mm-hmm. Iggy Brasdakis basically made his entire living, and now he is making a living doing just that, right? Playing off of – Simpsons penetration, Simpsons passing. So there's an immediate role for that. And you look at Franz Wagner and now Isaiah Livers replacing that production from those three. And both guys, I think, have every bit the potential to shoot better than mm-hmm. the three guys that they're replacing last year. Um, they might have other holes in their game, but that's for sure where you look for him to make an immediate impact. And I think there's a role on next year's team where Franz can score double-digit points basically just playing off of the catch. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, so, obviously, the defensive side, you know, the old, you are who you can guard, and, and what are his minutes based on, you know, what he can do defensively? Do you know anything about his, him on the defensive side? So, I really like his, his length, really mm-hmm. kind of changes the game for him defensively because 
he's a, he plays a lot of perimeter spots and he's so long that he gets a lot of deflections, a lot of steals. Kind of Mo, if you remember, had really good hands and like when he would guard against big guys. So sure. he has that to his game, which you can for sure see on film. He's not going to be a guy that you put out there against the other team's top wing and he can guard him effectively off the bounce. Like his foot speed is probably the biggest issue for him in that regard. Um, I think you can cheat a little bit because of his length, though. Mm-hmm. And he, I mean, he is, he's not some slow, lumbering-ish guy, you know, think of Mo as a freshman where he would just kind of be, it looked like his shoelaces were tied together sometimes trying to move around. Um, like, I think Franz, like, does, he does have some athleticism. He can run and jump and, like, he can get out oh, yeah. of transition, he can finish at the rim. Um, you know, he's not, he, he's much more of the modern Euro player as opposed to, you know, what a lot of people um, might have in their mind of what Euro players look like. You know what I mean? Without a doubt. And if you watch Alba Berlin play, mm-hmm. they play a really kind of attractive style, especially on offense. Do. And his feel for the game is really strong for a 17-year-old kid. Like when you go from watching high school film or even like low level college film to watching what they're running on a just possession by possession basis, his ability to cut, his ability to move, duck into the post, move mm-hmm. the ball, extra pass, like you, it's obvious why Beeline would have wanted to recruit him so badly and just and how he can fit. And I think that is really kind of an overlooked part of where last year's Michigan team kind of struggled is. Mm-hmm. They didn't really have guys who naturally made all those moves and cuts and extra pads. Like his offensive IQ is really through the roof. Yeah, yeah. And the actually Mo, Mo and I talked about that part of things where he's like, look, you know, I know everyone, the natural comparison is going to be to me, but he's such a different player. And it go, but it, but it also goes beyond the fact that, you know, Mo's a five and Franz is a two or three. Um, he's like, this is Mo talking. It was saying like he's way more mature. He's much smarter on the floor, and you know he's not the heat check guy. Was one of the things that he said that like he's not just gonna take put up shots just because he wants to put up shots. Um, he like he was really touting his kind of feel for how a team needs to play offensively and where his role is, and it, you can see it on all the film that you have cut too like it, it looks like a really young player who knows that he's playing with a bunch of older guys you know and and For i sure. think it's it'll be interesting to kind of see how that plays out when he gets to michigan where he's a freshman he's a, you know going to be an 18 year old with a bunch of 18 and 19 and 20 year olds he has a much better chance to not spend his freshman year in the doghouse like mo too right, so right that's good it helps to be a little quieter sometimes i would say mm-hmm um, so he won't just emerge in Atlantis, disappear for two months, and then reemerge. Come in the back for tournament. the first four, right? Uh, I find that unlikely, just given <laughs> the circumstances. So, I guess what would you kind of? You've watched the video, you've talked to Mo. What would you say is kind of your baseline expectation for what he gives Michigan in the next year? Yeah, I mean, I think he he walks in as a starter um, at the two or three. At the two, um, I think it, it just his skill level is going to be one of those things that's just not you're not going to be able to not utilize whatever you can get out of him. And um, like in terms of projecting what he does, I don't I don't know. Um, but the biggest thing is that he gives this team like a I think a major piece, and it gives the roster room to breathe where there might be guys that aren't going to have to be asked to do things that are a little over their heads and that they're not quite there. Right. Yeah. Um, I completely agree with that in the yeah. sense that before you needed probably four guys yeah. to play way above their, right. anything they've shown. Now you might need one or two to fill the gaps. You're mm-hmm. not trying to tape the whole boat back together right. with unproven pieces. You just need a little bit here, a little bit there. Yeah. And I, that's a big difference. And that, like, so if I had a guess, I'd say I think this is a guy that's going to shoot over forty percent on threes, um, and average in the neighborhood of double figures, if not more. What yeah, about you? and it, he also plays with the international line already, yes. which the rest of college basketball will be 
adjusting to. I I have a hard time. I know you talked about how do you get to 70 points or mm-hmm. whatever. Because that's such a tr- tricky situation, I, I have a hard time not seeing him being a double-digit yep. scorer on this team. I guess my big question is still who is that secondary creator outside of Xavier Simpson? And you're looking at a potentially big lineup if you have yeah. Wagner, yeah. Livers, Johns, what, at the 2-3-4? Mm-hmm. Um, and that could create its own issues. I mean, it'll be interesting to see, I guess, how how he's used and used more in the broad sense, like what position, et cetera. Right. Um, yeah, but you're right, though. The, think for for Michigan fans out there, you know, consider that opening day starting lineup could walk out on the court at six foot, six eight, six seven. Six nine seven foot. Yeah, and if I had to guess on November first, I would still think Eli starts ahead of Johns, but we'll see. Eli so Brooks starts I ahead think of Bog- Brandon Johns. Wagner would start at the three, Livers at the four. Okay. I think that's just seems more realistic early on, um, just in terms of getting something, but we'll see. Fair. I'd um, still uh, I'd still like to know what they're going to run. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's kind of hard to project a lot of these things. I mean, we're kind of pissing in the wind here, but oh, without a doubt, that's, what, that's why people listen to the pod. So, give me your your projected. Give me some projected numbers. What I wanted to hear the uh, the Dylan met, Saber metrics matrix something. What's your I think what's your system called? I don't have a system. Uh, there's no systems here. Uh, if I did, I'd be a lot of. I need a system, apparently. Um, I would say that it, I have a hard time not seeing him average double figures. Mm-hmm. But you also look, he's coming in late. He's not coming until right. fall semester. Right. He's learning English. I mean, I'm sure he knows plenty. Like, most seems to know a decent amount of English. But. Fine. Yeah. It's it's still an adjustment. Right. He's going to school for the he's going to college. He's moving across the ocean. It's a lot to put on a kid who just turned eighteen. Mm-hmm. Um I'm really curious to see how he plays with this uh German U eighteen team where he's playing more against kids his age group. Right. And kind of how that looks. It kinda helps reset the expectations point. for him in a bigger yeah. role. Um so I'll be watching that to see. But I he provides exactly what the roster needs, and he provides so much flexibility because of the ability to move him around different positions mm-hmm. and put less pressure on other guys to overachieve. I mean, we're probably putting too much expectations on him just given the circumstances sure. and when it happened and any conclusions that we'd already come to about the roster, but I can't really see him not being a guy who gets up, what, over 100 threes and makes 40% of them and... That's something that this team just desperately needs. I, think, I mean, you have to shoot. You have to have shooters. And there's going to be days in the gym where when they're going to go through drills, he's going to be the best shooter on the team. And so you have to keep him on the – you're going to have to find ways to put him on the floor. Um, so, yeah. But then – but, yeah, the added depth. I mean, it's just an enormous addition to get in July um, and, and for Juwan Howard to – um, kind of have a major win early to um, I know this is the narrative stuff that you don't really like or for, it, the, for those listening Dylan is shaking his head on the other side I mean it matters it's fine it's just over it's going to be overrated regardless but mm-hmm. we know you live for the narrative yeah that's right that's right um, all right anything else on this uh, I don't think so over? I think we pretty much exhausted it let's talk yeah. Hauser's yeah Hauser so um Joey Hauser, it was uh, it was great to be able to get over to uh, Stevens Point. It's a very small town in central Wisconsin. It sounded um, like a riveting bar scene up it there. Was, oof, it was a very interesting bar scene. Uh, I think we're just going to leave that story there. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but, but I got to hang out with Joey for um, probably about five or six hours and drive around town and uh, we had breakfast at a local diner, and um, and I just kind of, you know, just wanted to get to know the guy and find out why Michigan State and you know why him and his brother decided to to go their separate ways. Um, so 
I mean, first of all, one big takeaway was that I think all along, Hauser really wanted to go to Michigan State. And this is going back to high school. Back to um, high school, yep. And, you know, everyone knows that they were right in there in their recruitment. But, like, my one of my takeaways from actually being with him and talking to him was in the back of his mind, probably when he committed to Marquette originally, there was a part of him thinking that he was should have been going to Michigan State. And his family was even surprised that he didn't go to Michigan State. His grandparents bought Michigan State sweatshirts and were, you know, without telling him and were kind of ready to um, – getting ready for like the celebration and all that stuff. Um, he loved the school. He loves Izzo. They have a history. Um, so the Hauser's father, David Hauser, uh, played Division II basketball at Wisconsin Duluth. Uh, and he played for a guy named Dale Race. And Dale Race is one of these guys who's won a million games and been a coach forever. Um, so back in the day, he ran camps in Wisconsin, right? Needed staffing. So who's ends up as a staffer on the camp? Of course, Tom Izzo. Um, Tom Izzo worked his camps, became friends with Dale Rice, or Race, ends up introducing him to Judd. Judd ends up using Dale as an assistant on some, like, national team, whatever thing he coached. And, you know, long story short, they've just had a relationship for, like, three decades because, of course. So Dale... Not, you know, too long ago, I guess when they were, when the Hauser boys were, were probably entering high school or maybe, maybe when Joey was like in like eighth grade, he got his first D1 offer when he was in eighth grade from Bradley. Um, Dale told Izzo, hey, there's these two kids. I know their dad. They're good. Blah, blah, blah. And that was the first time Tom Izzo ever heard of the Hausers. So, um They've had the really good relationship, and um, but at the end of the day, Joey, the logical thing was to go to Marquette. It's the hometown school. His brother's there. They're recruiting him. Everyone thought they were going to play together. They wanted to play together, so that was the move. But um, the thing he said at, at breakfast was basically like, I don't know how many people get a second chance to make a decision like this, and I'm just really excited that I kind of like finally get the right fit, so... Um, I think he wanted to be there all along, and now he has the has the chance. So what what do you think? What kind of impact can he make, and how do you see? Like, what is that fit? Like, how does you see him fitting into Michigan State's system? And I know you, he that was one of the final things that I think you wrote that Izzo told him in his last pitch. Like, they went over like how he fit. What do you think yeah. that fit kind of is? Yeah, I mean, so initially it is that Kenny Goins four man stretch the court shoot threes working ball screens with a point guard um you know obviously Hauser has to sit out this year right now per mm-hmm. NCAA you know barring some waiver who god know whoever know who knows it's the NCAA mm-hmm. in 2019 so um, is he trying to get a waiver not, not that I know we'll see okay. um but I feel like if you can find a reason to submit for a waiver you submit something Worst thing they can do is say no. It's like anything else. You always apply for the better job. Always apply for a waiver if you're transferring in the NCAA. So. Career <laughs> advice with Quinn. So, uh, you know, the um, it's a shame because in this conversation, you'd love to picture Hauser with Cassius Winston, right? But that's, unless something crazy happens, he'll be next year and it'll be him with... Rocket Watts, Foster Lawyer, who knows at that point, right? Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's going to be a lot of that. They're going to, I think they're going to run offense through him. He's an excellent passer, uh, sees the floor well, has a great feel for the game. He's comfortable away from the basket, um, but he's also a high level, you know, 40% plus three point shooter. So it has to be respected by defenses. So I think you can put him in a pick pop, uh, four spot, um, but then also let him dictate some things. You know, Joey himself thinks that thinks of himself as a point forward, which, I mean, in basketball now, anyone over 6'6 thinks that they're a point forward, but um, he actually does have some of that skill set to him. So I think they're going to run some stuff through him um, and let him be a creator, facilitator, shooter. Yeah, in the film I watched of him, he definitely 
showed more of that Mm -hmm. than I kind of expected, right? Like you see a guy that big, you don't expect him to have ball screen possessions logged in his synergy or anything like that, but he can do a little bit of that, which could probably open up a lot of possibilities and really help. Like just even having that in the back pocket just allows you a lot more flexibility and allows the offense to flow a lot better when you have multidimensional pieces that maybe aren't in spots where you usually have a, sort of a playmaker or this and that. So that's an interesting kind of twist, I would say, to it. And, like, do you see that he he could project to eventually move more toward, like, playing the three or, like, a big line? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, I could, yeah. See, I could definitely see that. Um, if they're, even regardless of if they're backlogged at, at position-wise or anything like that or have certain bodies, um, I think he could actually, I think he could naturally be a three for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, he needs to up his athleticism a little bit. Um, he needs to get... You know, actually, a three would be a little bit better because if if you have extra post defenders out there and he doesn't have to guard the post, that would probably be ideal for him. Um, he's one of these guys who he's about two hundred fifteen pounds right now. That's his playing weight. Um, in a perfect world, he would add ten fifteen pounds of muscle to be able to guard a postman um, and hold his own down there. Right now, he gets moved defensively. Um, he's a bit of a defensive liability. He's he struggles laterally against faster guys and he struggles physically against bigger guys. Um, but he, he would like to add weight, but one of the things he told me was that he gets, he feels slower. Like he really mm-hmm. feels slower when he does add weight. So he's an 18 year old or 19 year old, whatever, who's trying to kind of strike that balance, balance. right now of what he is physically. Um, and that's a work in progress and, you know, sitting out a year, he of course doesn't want to sit out a year. No one wants to, and he's he missed so much time in high school with injuries. Um, it's not a small deal that this guy has to sit out again. So, um, but I think for his long term potential and future, um, a year just working on himself healthy for the first time um, is is going to be big because you know a lot of people do like. I've talked to some NBA guys out here who they know Hauser, like they are well aware of him. He's on the radar. Um, a lot of people like his game and think that he could project to something. Um, so having a year to work on the kind of evolution of his game and do so healthy because the time that he's sat out hasn't been that productive because he was in a boot. He had surgery on his mm-hmm. foot, you know, like he's never really had a chance, I think, to kind of catch up with catch up his body with his talent, if that makes sense. Yeah, for a guy who has the liabilities you describe, like quickness, strength, kind of combining all that, a year sitting out is probably the best thing you can really ask for because that's something you can improve Mm -hmm. just by being in the gym and working out. I find it interesting to kind of shift from a Marquette program that's all offense, kind of no defense, to Mm -hmm. Michigan State. It's certainly, I mean, really both Hauser brothers went from a program that was radically different than yes. Wojo's program, which I found a little bit unique. And it would be an interesting transition for him to go. I mean, I'm sure practices are going to be very different. And I guess the it's really just the style of play on the court is going to be very different. Style of play, no doubt. Um, you know, coaching-wise, I mean, you know, Wojo's super intense um, in a lot of ways. Uh, but Izzo is kind of intense in a different way. Um, and I feel like that, I feel like Izzo intense in a different way can just stand on its own. Of you don't have doesn't matter the other coach point. you put next to him. Totally, totally fair. Um, the yeah, the fit wise, like because I talked to Sam at length as well. Um, and anyone particularly interested in that, I'll have a separate story on on Sam. I wanted to write about him individually here, um, but the I feel like they both kind of felt that they're. They're going to the right places now, in not in, just in terms of university or coach or whatever, but in terms of style of play, in terms of everything that that kind of just fits who they are. Um, like Sam, one thing Sam said to me was like, "We've never been really like individuals, and now we're kind of going to the places that we want to go, and we're just going to be, mm-hmm. you know, regular basketball players, and we don't have to be kind of a, a, a package thing." Um, and for Joey specifically on this is. You know, I'm the youngest of six, and so like I kind of tried to talk to him like as a 
like younger brother, right? Like mm-hmm. I know, I, I think I kind of understand some of these things and that's how, that's the kind of level that we were talking on. It was really interesting. And one of the things he said was he plays very differently than his brother. Like they're not interchangeable guys. It's not the same basketball player, right? Like Sam is basically a spot up shooter who has some ball skill, but he's a really heady player, tough as shit. Um, blah, 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 leader, all that stuff. Joey's probably a little bit less mature, um, more talented, wider range of skills, um, and but not, not as pigeonholed probably into a spot as Sam is. So in talking to Joey about this, you know, he said, I've always kind of felt that everywhere I've gone, it's just been like, you just fill your brother's spot. Right, like hmm. you're just kind of working into you're his... assumed to be exactly. the next version of him. Exactly, you know, it's just kind of fitting that spot. And he's just like, I'm a totally different player, but I've kind of been in this. I've, my whole life has been hmm. fitting. All right, in practice, this is what. Well, Joey was in this spot, so now you or Sam was in this spot, so now you're in this spot, right? Like, that's a thing. So, um, he's definitely really excited about going to a place where there is zero expectation of what or who he is he's supposed to be yeah just based on his brother right which he said his entire life he's going to walk into a gym right they're going to roll the ball out and he's going to be a basketball player and they're going to find the best spot to put him in yeah i really liked uh in your story Izzo's last kind of recruiting pitch to him where it was like just forget take your brother out of it and go where you want to go that was a that was a nice little move there i like that yeah it was smart um I think Izzo knows what he's doing when it comes to conversations like that. Um, so, yeah, is there, uh, I'm trying to think, projecting the t- that lineup, that 2021 lineup, let's pull up uh, that roster. Um, I mean, I think, without a doubt, you've, you've watched some film on him and stuff, but like, I can't imagine a scenario where he's not walking in as the starting four. Yeah, that sounds that sounds right. So you would I think look be, at. I think he'd be the starting four this year. Yeah, I, certainly this year. I would say. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you, you get away, he could. If you if he was in, instantly eligible for some reason, and you yeah. put him on this team, he would be a huge piece just because of what they need to replace out of Goins, and then just mm-hmm. how he could do even more in that spot. That would be a really intriguing fit. Yeah. Next, like looking ahead, I mean, it's tough because some of Michigan State's kind of young front court players are still unproven, but I would certainly think that he would slot right in there at right. the starting four, right? Yeah. Or like going to that conversation about the three spot, you know, if there is a scenario where Aaron Henry, it's not, I don't think it's in any way out of the realm of possibility where this is the last year Aaron Henry's at Michigan State. Um, oh. You don't think he could be a pro after this year? I, could, I think he could. I don't know that I would. He wouldn't be the first Michigan State player that I would think would leave early after this year. Xavier Tillman? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think you could lose both of them after this year. That's fair. Um, so, yeah, there's point being, like, there's spots all, there could be spots all over the place where, like, having a guy in a Hauser who not only, like, take his talent out of it and what he can be, like, this is a dude who already averaged 10 points in the Big East playing as a freshman. Like, the luxury that Michigan State could have of having him as a newcomer on next year's team if an actual scenario plays out where you lose Cassius Winston, Josh Langford, you know, and Aaron Henry or Xavier Tillman or both or something like that. Yeah, having, you... a, having a guy that you're adding to the, the lineup that has experience at this level, like, is huge. That's huge. Yeah, and if you look at... Michigan State's team that season, there's not a lot of, there's not going to be a lot of experienced pieces because you're looking at losing Winston and Langford for sure, right? So you lose that kind of experience. You probably have maybe Tillman back as a junior, but either way, having a guy who's proven and you're, it's really going to be a transition year when you go from just such a sure thing and building around Winston to something new. Having a guy like Hauser who's been through a conference season and really gets that is. Probably a really nice luxury. It's a it's a good year to bring in a sit out transfer. I would say. Yeah, I mean, so looking at that that twenty twenty one roster, um, it would in theory be 
Tillman, Kithier, Lawyer, Gabe Brown, Marcus Bingham, Aaron Henry, Rocket Watts, Malik Hall, Julius Marble, Jalen Terry, and now um, Joey Hauser. So um, it's young. That's a young team, right? Yeah, and you have all these forwards, like Hall, Mar- like you don't really I know how say they're that because fit. right now it's young. But in a year from now, we wouldn't be talking, right? Like there's a there's a scenario right where if Gabe if Gabe Brown and Marcus Bingham get minutes this year, and suddenly they have a, they look very different at this point next year. So I, I, I'm probably presumptuous saying that. But. That's that's true, but you're also looking at a situation where you're gonna have. You're going to lose basically five seniors over two years who played huge roles sure, mostly, right? Sure, sure. With Winston, Langford, Kyle Arns, Goins, and then McQuaid over two years. Like you're really retool. Like this year's team is retooling, but the next team will be a new whole era, right? Mm-hmm. When you lose a point guard like that, it just has that Im- impact. Yeah. You yeah, can't be a young team when you have a senior All-American point guard. It's going to be – a kind of scrapping it and starting over when you lose a guy like Cassius, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I have to plug in this laptop. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have any other questions about my lovely visit to central Wisconsin? Uh, I do not. I mean, I think we, it seems like a lovely uh, place <laughs> to visit. Uh, it's kind of a transition from central Wisconsin to Vegas. Slightly. Slightly. They are... Uh, they are unique in their own ways, we'll say. But uh, the funny thing being with Hauser there is uh, the idea that it's a, it's a smallish town, and these guys are like folk heroes there. It's, it's wild. So we're sitting at the diner, and uh, just mid-conversation, some guy, like some 60-year-old guy, sheepishly walks up to the table and is, uh, is like, excuse me, excuse me, guys. Are you are you Joey Hauser? And Joey's like, yeah, hey, how are you? And the guy's like, man, I'm a I'm a big fan. And Bob, like, it is, it's big time, small town America. You know, think think Friday Night Lights kind of uh, scene of the locals right in the diner talking about where the Hausers are going to go. Like, it was not, it's not a small deal that they did not go to Wisconsin. That's yeah, I was going to say, was his next question, why the hell didn't you I go mean, to Wisconsin? It was, and and Joey mentioned that he's like, everywhere I go, it's always like. Hey, congratulations on going to Michigan State. Why didn't you go to Wisconsin? Like every every single time. So um, both of them were ready to get up and get out of there for sure. Like they were very excited to pack up the car and go kind of start their next chapters because everything's been dissected. Like I don't know how much Michigan State fans have really followed this, but like the whole – the the palace intrigue about like why the Hausers left Marquette and you know were they going to go to Wisconsin and why didn't they both go to Wisconsin is like it's a major major thing out there um, and both of these guys are finally kind of getting a chance I think to get away from that and that's uh, <laughs> when I got to the house I had like a nice nice little chat with uh, David the, the father and he kind of left it as like. And just remember, and kind of looked at both the boys, right? Sam and Joey were both sitting there. He's just like, we're not talking about Marquette. <laughs> like, this, you're not, this is not going to be what you guys are all going to talk about here. Um, and, you know, so I tried to respect that as much as possible. And in truth, like, both of the boys were not interested in talking or rehashing why they were leaving or what went down or um, Marcus Howard or Wojo or, the you know, all of this stuff. Um, it just wasn't going to happen. So... Um, that's, that was what I was kind of working with. So his red shirt year at yeah. Marquette. Yes. Will he get a medical for that year? Will, so will I'd he be, be a, stunned a if he sophomore did. next year or a, yeah, junior? I would be stunned if he does not get that year of eligibility back. Uh, I mean, I'm operating basically under the uh, assumption that he has three years of eligibility. Um, okay. I think it's an easy waiver. I don't see why it would be a thing, um, considering what some of the others are given out for. Um, this one looks pretty cut and dry to me. So the backstory there for folks, um, Hauser missed his um, missed half of his junior year in high school with an ankle injury. It lingered, it lingered, it lingered. 
he played one game as a senior and went and got an MRI and he had to have surgery. So that's the end of his senior year playing, right? So he goes, he has surgery. The folks at Marquette say, why not finish your first term or whatever at high school, enter college early, and then you can work in our strength and conditioning stuff and rehab with us and be around the program and blah, 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 blah. Have you and ever heard of that? I've never heard of that. I mean, I'm sure it's happened, but I can't Seems think like of it. Seems like an odd example. decision. It, it was, I think it's an odd decision. And Joey like regrets it big time because he feels like he missed out on a lot of being a high school senior. Um, like forget the eligibility stuff, right? Like he's personally like, I really regret doing it. But anyway, who cares? <laughs> so like this idea of um, enrolling in the second semester though ended up counting as a registered year. Okay. So because of that, yeah. technically he has two years of eligibility at Michigan State because he played as a freshman. He redshirted for half of a year and it's now all of his stuff's kind of messed up. But I just I can't see how that wouldn't fly as getting an alf I mean personally I don't think Joey Hauser has any interest in spending three years playing at Michigan State, right? He's going to probably want to pursue his talents and career, and, you know, everyone wants to be a pro, and I he's no different. So um, if needed, though, right, if he wants to play a third mm -hmm. year, I would be stunned if they couldn't get that done. I... I... I'm happy for him. I feel like he's been forced to do a bunch of stuff he didn't want to do his entire life, and now he's finally breaking free. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. There you go. Good, good for him. Everyone's telling him to skip his senior year of college just to uh, – that's it just yeah. seems like a lot of pressure has been put on him. It yeah. seems like he's I, no, I, off I, to greener pastures. I, I think that was definitely the kind of feel that I got. And, like, he uh, – I think he, like, went – back to his high school graduation and like was supposed to walk but he felt like really awkward so he didn't walk and like his friends were there but then like he had friends in college now like it's really I mean it's a really interesting story just of like this kind of confused 17 year old getting pulled in a lot of different directions at that time and um, like I said like he's the, so like Sam Hauser is really really like he's just an older guy like he's just one of those guys you talk to and he just kind of has that disposition about him where he's really mature and all that stuff. And just Joey's not. He's just a different guy. Um, he's younger, and he kind of has that, you know, he's just less mature. So um, I think it was all a lot for him uh, to, to get to your point. Yeah, I think you're spot on there. <laughs> What's happening over there? My dog's going crazy over here. I was trying to mute it. <laughs> Just bring, I thought the dogs are part of this podcast. That's all right. Let's saw just be mail, happy there's no... I saw the mail carrier walking up, and I knew it was coming. Uh -oh. I tried to prevent it. There's no... Uh, at least there's no sirens or helicopters or... You're going to get someone killed with those sirens, man. <laughs> I, I do apologize to everyone who was listening to the last pod and, th and started pulling over thinking that they were about to get a ticket because of the amount of sirens going on in the background of my recording. So Because you refuse to uh, shut the window in your uh, recording studio over there. Well, it's a, that house is hot as hell. It's the middle of summer, man. This is why basketball not, podcasts are meant for the fall and the we're, winter. We're not, all, we're not all living in lavish conditions like you with your central air or whatever and your... <laughs> your fancy suburban Cleveland lifestyle, you know? That's it. <laughs> Air conditioning. <laughs> Lavish. All right. Do we have anything else to touch on? Do you want to talk um, scheduling I, or anything? I think that's it. I think we want to do kind of a recruiting podcast in yeah. the next couple of weeks. So we're going to dive into 2020 recruiting, where all that stands. Um, this week is currently the Peach Jam and every other shoe company's big tournament. It's the only weekend of live evaluation for coaches in grassroots events. Mm -hmm. um, they took it down. It used to be three weeks in July. Now it's just this week. And then 
There are some regional camps later in the month along with USA Basketball. Um, so we'll see how all that plays out. But this is really the week where college coaches are going to be bouncing around hot gyms in or over-air-conditioned gyms in the South. And kind of really Jawan Howard's first time recruiting at AU events uh-huh. because June was more of a high school camps high school shootouts and that was a little tricky because some states didn't really bother to organize a high school shootout worth the damn similar (laughs) to michigan uh other school other states did and their kids got more scholarships and attention but Mm. that's neither here nor there uh that's about we so we'll dive into recruiting um yeah we'll see what else we have coming up for you guys love it uh if anyone has any questions for that episode about recruiting or anything like that feel free to fire away on twitter uh, we'll try to get it on that um, on that episode. So um, that's it. I'm going on vacation. I'm going <laughs> on my, my big golf trip. Uh, be up north, trying to just win. Stay win, alive. Win the, no man. Win the barrel. Win the barrel. That's the. Uh, I'm very excited. Where are you, where, where will we handicap you? Kind of in the in the field. In the field. Uh, where it's 12 of us, we're doing two six-man teams, Ryder Cup style. Um, but there will be an individual champion. Of course, I'm, you know, last year I was well positioned only to lose in match play on the, in the final, on the final, uh, round. We play seven rounds in four days. Um, but, uh, this is it. Redemption. I'm going for it, man. I'm taking the field. <laughs> You're an asshole. All right, that'll do it for this week. Uh, Be sure to tip your bartenders and servers, and thanks for listening, everyone.